we've had a change in schedule. Um, Dr. Frieden, our next speaker, has an in MSNBC interview, uh, so we're going to move the Christofferson lecture up. So the, Christof the Christofferson lecture is given by an internationally recognized individual who has made significant contributions to international child health. This year's speaker is Dr. Tom Frieden, director of the Sitters for Disease Control and Prevention, our nation's health protection agency. Since 2009, he has worked to control health threats from infectious diseases, respond to emergencies, and battle the leading causes of death in our nation and around the world. Prior to leading CDC, Dr. Frieden served as New York City Health Commissioner, where he helped reduce smoking, eliminate trans fats from restaurants, and initiate the country's largest community-based electronic health records project. He also led New York City's tuberculosis control program that reduced multi-drug resistant cases by 80%. His topic today is global progress and unfinished business in child health. Please welcome Dr. Frieden. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with uh, such a wonderful group of pediatricians. I have always said that I believe that of all of the fields of medicine, pediatricians have the deepest and best understanding of what public health is. So thank you for what you do. I've been asked to talk about global health, and I will uh, continue. Uh, confine my re remarks solely to global issues, but I really thank you for what you do day in and day out, not only in global health, but particularly in the U.S. We have made real progress in global health. Deaths among children below the age of five globally have decreased by a third in the past 15 years. That pro progress has not been equal. You can see the red bars here, which represent uh, death in the first um, uh, uh, from month one to month 60, have decreased quite substantially, whereas uh, deaths in the first um, 28 days have decreased only gradually. But overall, we've seen real progress. And one of the themes in global health is we should celebrate progress, but never relax, never be comfortable with the level of progress we've achieved, because so much more is both necessary and possible. Under five mortality remains by far the highest in parts of Africa and in South Asia. About six million children under the age of five die each year around the world. In the different shades of yellow on this slide, you can see the neonatal deaths, which account now for 44% of all of the deaths of children under the age of five, and on the, in the other colors, examples of diarrhea, measles, injury, malaria, AIDS, uh, which contribute to child mortality. Roughly one in five child deaths in the world today is from a disease that could have been prevented by vaccination. So while we have made tremendous progress on reducing deaths from vaccine-preventable diseases, it is unfinished business. More than half of all of the early child deaths could be prevented with simple and low-cost technologies that are available today. Malnutrition remains far too common, and we're increasingly recognizing and documenting the lifelong impacts of malnutrition in utero and in early childhood. Vaccine-preventable diseases continue to kill at least 1.3 million children each year. Nearly one in 10 of the deaths that occur from childhood disease are from lack of safe drinking water and sanitation. And malaria continues as a major killer of children. Over the past few months, I had the privilege of traveling throughout Africa, and I saw the continuing enormous burden of malaria. 
Although malaria deaths have fallen by roughly half, there are still more than a half a million children each year who die from a disease that's both preventable and treatable. And walking through the wards of a hospital in Kinshasa and the Democratic Republic of Congo, I was deeply disturbed to see young children who would likely not survive their bout with malaria. That should not occur in today's world, and we must double down on our efforts to make a difference and prevent preventable deaths. The impact of vaccines globally is quite remarkable. If we look at the period from 1980 to 2012, diphtheria, measles, pertussis, polio, tetanus, all down by no, at least 90%, while the population at risk increased by nearly 60%. So this is real progress. And there's more to be done. Vaccines could save 25 million lives in this decade. Measles is unfinished business, hepatitis, unfinished business, and the further expansion of pneumococcal and rotavirus vaccines around the world are saving millions of lives. And we know that they not only save lives, by preventing illness, they prevent stunting and malnutrition. They prevent a host of both infectious and non-infectious problems. The Gavi Alliance has made a tremendous contribution to improvements in vaccines and immunizations. They've closed the gaps in immunization coverage between high, medium, or middle, and low-income countries. And what you can see here is that in the high-income countries, there's a rapid adoption. We would like to say not rapid enough. And I would point out that uh, there are countries around the world, including Rwanda, that have higher HPV vaccination rates than the United States in their target population. But as a general rule, what happened was vaccines and other technologies became available in the high-income countries, and then there was a lag of 10 or 20 or 25 years before those became available in low- and middle-income countries. And what Gavi has done focusing on low-income countries is to close that gap so that vaccines get introduced as soon as they can be made in bulk and funds can be raised and systems can be established to safely and effectively provide vaccination coverage around the world. And what you can see is that large gap. Um, you can see the slides, can't you? <laughs> uh, that large gap between uh, uh, high and uh, low income countries of a couple of decades ago has fallen to a small gap currently. I'd like to talk about polio for a bit. Uh, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we've been working on polio eradication since 1988. And I want to really thank Rotary International, which first sounded the call for eradication in 1985. Polio cases are down by more than 99.9%. Four out of six regions of the world are polio free. Types two and three poliovirus, there are three wild types, one, two, and three, appear to have been eradicated. Nigeria is no longer endemic, and that required an enormous amount of effort from many partners to achieve. And the entire African region has not had a wild polio case in more than a year. In this time period, 13 million cases of paralytic polio did not occur that would have occurred otherwise. At least 650,000 deaths from polio were prevented. And think about it, more than 10 million children who would have been disabled for life were not disabled. We have gone from 350,000 cases per year, nearly 1,000 cases a day, to 58 cases so far in 2015. What we saw was the dramatic decrease in the 90s and then the challenge of getting to zero. Uh, I moved to India in October of 1996. Polio eradication uh, was had tremendous momentum at that time. I spent five years working on tuberculosis control in India, but I saw uh, the tremendous effort of polio eradication in India. A hundred million children vaccinated during vaccination campaigns. And yet, for much of the 2000s, there was stagnation in both India and Nigeria. In fact, in Nigeria, vaccination rates went down. 
and the disease spread to multiple neighboring countries. But starting at the end of the last decade, in 2008, 2009, there was intensification in India. And by 2011, India was polio free and has not had a polio case since with very robust surveillance. So we know they are truly polio free. Then we turned attention to Nigeria and we surged in to put hundreds of staff into the districts that had the lowest vaccination rates to work in a structured and systematic way through emergency operations centers to reach into communities and provide general health services so that people would understand that we care not just about eradication of a virus but truly about the communities where that virus was continuing to spread. We worked with religious leaders and political leaders with a partnership, a true partnership from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Rotary International, WHO, UNICEF, and staff from the Centers for Disease Control who worked there around the clock to get over the finish line. And we do now think, even with good surveillance, uh, that we are at zero in Nigeria and possibly at zero in all of Africa. That leaves only uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and there the challenge is big, but the battle uh, is on, and we see real progress in both countries, uh, real challenges. Ending polio for good will be one of the greatest achievements in human history. Stopping all circulating vaccine-derived outbreaks is also important. We're strengthening surveillance, which is a critical component of polio eradication, and in fact, of all effective public health, and I would say health programs, the regular, consistent, timely, accurate collection analysis and use of information crucial to make decisions and stop outbreaks. High vaccination coverage is crucial and there will be a, a substantial legacy from polio eradication. Uh, I'm privileged to serve as the chair of the polio, uh, uh, sorry, the polio oversight board and there are four objectives in the end game of polio. Stopping polio uh, everywhere, strengthening immunization systems, containment, eliminating it from most laboratories, and planning for a legacy so that emergency response, outbreak response, laboratory networks, surveillance systems, immunization systems are strengthened through this partnership. Global measles is a tremendous success story, but again, unfinished. We've had a 75% drop in measles deaths, but still at least 140,000 deaths a year. This is from India. You can see that in general, they're doing well, but there are still far too many places in the center of the country, in the Northeast, by state and by district, where vaccination rates need to further improve. And strengthening measles vaccination can improve entire immunization systems, because to do this right, you need a cold chain, you need the healthcare system working, you need information systems. That's why measles vaccination is an indicator of how good the public health and healthcare system are, is doing. Hepatitis B vaccination, a tremendous success story in China. 20 million chronic HBV infections prevented, 4 million lives saved, and globally, an, another 5 million lives saved. So vaccines truly are one of the greatest gifts to humanity uh, ever. Global, <laughs> global malaria deaths have fallen dramatically. Uh, and in fact, when you travel throughout Africa, you find dramatic differences with the use of bed nets, rapid diagnostic tests, artemisinin containing treatments. We're seeing from 25 to 50 percent of all child mortality in some areas was from malaria to, in some communities, the elimination of malaria or the control of malaria. So tremendous progress in malaria control. The use of vector or mosquito control interventions, insecticide treated nets and indoor residual spraying has increased dramatically. You can see a, a big scale up, but much more progress is needed. I want to talk a bit about maternal and child health and the, inter, and the interaction between these. It's of cesarean section around the world. And we have a situation where there are as too high a prevalence of primary cesarean section in many countries and too low a rate of cesarean section in many countries. Any time less than 5% of pregnancies are resulting in cesarean section, 
it is highly likely that really bad things are happening to mothers and to infants. So what we did at CDC was to initiate, conceptualize, and start a program in Uganda and Zambia to answer a question. And the question was an audacious one. Could we cut maternal mortality in half in just a couple of years? And the way to do that is to involve communities, to make cesarean sections and anesthesia accessible remotely, to improve neonatal resuscitation. And what we see here uh, in both countries is a dramatic increase in cesarean sections, a dramatic decrease in maternal mortality rate, and a significant decrease in perinatal mortality. We think that this program, which is now under the auspices of USAID, actually has achieved its goal of having maternal mortality in just a few years, just two years. One of the next big things, perhaps the next big thing in global health, is global health security. The Ebola epidemic has told us clearly that we face inevitable risks. We don't know what the next outbreak will be or where it will be from or when it will occur, but we're certain that it will occur and that it may be a risk to any country in the world, to any family and child in the world. We have emerging organisms like Ebola, SARS, MERS, or the next HIV. We have drug resistance and increasingly the risk of organisms resistant to all antibiotics and the specter of intentional creation and intentional or in unintentional release of dangerous pathogens. But there's a public health framework. There are new tools like rapid diagnostics and we have examples of successful outbreak control that can make a huge difference. The global health security agenda is about good health and public health around the world so that threats can be recognized when they first emerge, stopped promptly, and prevented wherever possible. In Haiti, where we've been working on this type of program for years, we've not only been able to improve preparedness, but also to double vaccination rates, to double treatment rates for HIV, to, to come close to the virtual elimination of maternal to child transmission of HIV. This is in a country where you don't often hear Haiti and progress in the same sentence, but focusing on strengthening the public health system has enormous payoffs for the country, for public health, and for the region. We're now turning our attention to the elimination of malaria from Haiti, which we think is possible. There are lots of additional benefits from strengthening global health security. It protects the poorest countries and the most neglected people. There are health and economic benefits. It strengthens the country capacity to focus and implement health programs. It creates sustainable systems that increase vaccination coverage and addresses antimicrobial resistance. It strengthens organizational capacity and resilience to address any health threats, and it involves all sectors segments and sectors of society by taking a holistic approach. Finally, I'd like to review this one last slide which shows how we've come, how far we have to go and far, how far we've come. The green bars show for core public health interventions where we are relative to the 100% goal. An epidemiologist is someone who loses sleep over denominators. All of us as healthcare providers think about every last child, every person who could benefit from an intervention and is not benefiting. These are some of the most important interventions available to humanity and we're only at 60 to 80 percent for some. For others we're down in the 20 percent range but if you want to see the glass half empty or half full, you can, because in green uh, is where we were as of 2009 when we did this analysis, 2008, excuse me. Uh, in blue is where the data is available, where we are in 2014. We've made tremendous progress. We've made great strides in global health, but we have much further to go. We have literally saved tens of millions of lives, but tens of millions more lives are in the balance. And working together between public health and clinical medicine, between the pediatric community and the public health community, between national and global challenges, I'm confident that we will save those lives. Thank you very much.
Dr. Frieden, the American Academy of Pediatrics would just like to thank you so much for all the work that you've done and, and for children all around the world. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.